Let's go. Canada's first gold medal. Who knew? Who knew? Just kidding. Maybe, maybe Nigeria's first gold medal. Whichever federation will pay me, I'll give them a gold medal. Um, as the announcer said, my name is Fope, and I have the, the privilege of, of joining Jesus and pastoring the teenagers in this church. And I'm so excited to be here with you this weekend. Listen, at the beginning of the month, we actually, you guys sent us out to, do, to be missionaries. Um, and we went to Kelowna, uh, a camp called Green Bay Bible Camp. And 24 of us went and we shared the message of Jesus with, with uh, kids who didn't know about Jesus, unchurched students. So I just want to say thank you so much for that and for sending us. And I wanted to share a story, if I may. Um, I, can I? Can I share a story? I will because I have the mic. So it, it doesn't matter what you have said. But um, uh, it's a story about what God did. And when we came back, the camp director actually sent us a message. And she received a message from a mother, a Christian mom, one of the rare Christian moms who was actually at this uh, center, kid at this camp, to this camp. And she said that um, she, before the camp started, she got her son. Her son's name is Zion. And they prayed together. And she said, hey, listen, Zion, this camp you're going to, Green Bay Bible Camp, on the beach of this camp, I actually experienced Jesus for the first time. That's where I gave my life to Jesus. It's a special camp. So... God's going to be doing a lot of incredible things. But then she tells her son, hey, um, I'm going to teach you a prayer to pray about the unexpected. That God does unexpected things, right? So, so I'm going to teach you this prayer. And then son was like, okay, that's cool. And then um, they went to camp and it was incredible. And on the last day of camp, Zion, her son, went to the beach, which is so incredible. And he started to pray this prayer that his mom said. It's like, hey, it's the last day, God, I want you to do something unexpected. And one of our student leaders, the students that you sponsored to go to this mission trip, actually was walking around the beach doing his devo early in the morning. And he sees this, this child and he says, hey, can I read a scripture to you? He reads the scripture and they pray together and he fist bumps him. And Zion said that he never saw this, this leader again, right? And this parent, Zion comes home and, and says, hey, I don't remember this leader. I don't even remember the passage he read, but... It's like, mom, God actually showed up. And the mom sent this uh, message to us. She said, that beach I met Jesus, that beach I gave my life to him, and that beach I got baptized, and that beach my son had God show up. Isn't that incredible? Come on, that's, that's, that's so good. God is incredible. And, 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 you know, maybe you're watching online or, or, or you're here and you're not a Christian. You're like, man, that's an incredible story. What a coincidence. We Christians know that when we continue to follow Jesus, coincidences seem to happen all the time. Because God is good and he's involved in our lives. So I just want to say thank you so much. And also to just say that this is a great example. This story is a great example of, of all generations working together. So you guys, older men and older women, you guys sponsored us to be able to go to this camp. And there were some younger women and younger men on the camp who were able to, to volunteer their time to supervise, right? I think of Aaron and Abby and Matthew and IBK and Tammy. And because of them, we were able to go on this mission trip. And because of that, a student actually got to encounter God. See, we talk a lot about, about unity in the church, right? But the truth is we need cultural unity, we need theological unity, we need ethnic unity, but we also need intergenerational unity. See, 1 Timothy, the book we, we've, been, we've been going through is a letter that was actually written from Paul, this, this experienced and seasoned pastor, and he writes to this, to, this, to this rookie pastor, this young pastor named Timothy. And it's interesting because you look at what's going on in the church in Ephesus, right, which is where Timothy is called to pastor, and it's no joke. There's false teachers, and these false teachers weren't just random people. They were Jewish thinkers, really smart, intelligent people. They knew the law. There was persecution going on. There was a lot of confusion. And Paul sends Timothy, who, if you guys are familiar with Timothy's history, he's a, he's a young man, but he's also Greek. What does that mean? He doesn't know a lot about the law. He's just learning about the Old Testament. And Paul says, hey, I know you're young. I know you're inexperienced. I'm still calling you to go. And he says, hey, it doesn't matter if you're young. Don't let anyone look down on you. But set an example. 
How many of you guys know that God is calling all of us to be people of examples rather than people of excuses? Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your culture, doesn't matter what you're going through, where you're coming from, God is calling you to be a person of example. And when we think about this, this, you know, the mission strip and what God was doing, you guys giving, it's a sign that when we actually step out, regardless of our age, and when we invite and involve other people from other ages, God actually does incredible things. God does incredible things through us. I love this. Jesus says in John 17, 23, he's about to die. Right? He's about to die. And when someone's about to die, they're not thinking of random thoughts. They think about the main thing. And when Jesus is about to die, what's the main thing on his mind? You guys, the church. And he says this to the disciples. He prays this prayer. He says, I pray that, that I would be in the church and you would be, God would be in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you've sent me and you've loved them even as you've loved me. Jesus is praying this prayer, and he says the world will know when we're all united. That's incredible. See, when you're sad that Jesus isn't answering your prayer, look in the mirror and say, how are you answering Jesus' prayer by being united? How are you getting together with people from other generations, and how are you being united? Because it's through our unity that people will know Jesus. So Paul starts the letter off um, in chapter 5, and he continues and he says this to Timothy. If you guys want to turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, he says this. Hey, I know that there's going to be a lot of false teaching going on. I know that you're going to have to correct people older than you, smarter than you. But he says this. Don't rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he was your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters. And treat them with absolute purity. And that word purity is the same word he uses in the chapter before when he says, set an example, Timothy. Set an example in purity. And that's the idea of being dedicated to God. See, our dedication to God is reflected in the way we treat our family. See, when Jesus, you know, Paul says to Timothy, train yourself in godliness. You know what your first training ground in godliness is? It's in your family. With your family. So Paul says, I know these people might be, might be spreading false teaching, but first of all, if they're a Christian, they are part of your family. See, when you become a Christian, you become a part of God's household, God's family. So your obligation is to your immediate family, but it always has to extend to your Christian family as well. Are you with me this weekend? And this is so hard. You know, a lot of us, has been, we've been hurt by our families. You know, some of us have annoying siblings. Some of us, you know, have strict parents, okay? Not me. My parents are perfect, and I love my siblings. They're watching online or in person. <laughs> but it's hard because we, we disagree with them, and, and Paul knows this with Timothy. He says, hey, I know you're going to fight with this church family, but, you know, you're always going to have to extend charity. And how many of you guys know that it's hard to extend charity to someone when you disagree with them? It's so hard. I remember I used to get into this argument all the time with my mom. I could still see it, you know. I'm like preparing to go on mission trips or even teach in church and do all these different things. But then I'll be mean to my siblings and I'll, you know, make fun of them. And my mom would be like, I should always say this line. It's so annoying. But it's so true. <laughs> she always said this, charity begins at home. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, you know. But there's, I'm just like. You know, I'm, I'm going to, on a mission trip. I'm going to serve people who want me there. These guys don't want me here. They don't deserve me, blah, blah, blah. And she would always say, charity begins at home. If you can't do it here, you're not going to be able to do it out there. See, our capa- God is always calling our capacity to love to extend from our family to his family. And that's something I struggle with because... When I think about making an impact in the world, I always think about these big social issues that are largely connected to some of the big things going on in the world. Environmental issues or, or political violence or, you know, war and all that. I'm like, I want to make a difference there. I, you know, I want to I make an impact there. And I wonder if Timothy was the same way where 
where Paul is writing this letter and he's like, man, like this is a lot to think about. False teaching, persecution, confusion. These are big issues. I wonder if Paul in this passage just brings it back to be like, first of all, just take care of your family. Love your family. See, the Bible has a lot to say about how to have genuine Christian faith. And the first way that is reflected is in how we treat our family. And when we treat our family well, well, the faith that we foster becomes this incredible example to the world of God's love. So Paul continues and he says this, hey, treat everyone, you know, with respect. And he says this, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, then they should first learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. And so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left alone puts all her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask for God's help. I just think this is incredible because here you have false teaching going on, things threatening to destroy the church from the inside out. And Paul has been been dropping tiny hints on the sources of these false teachings, but he never really gets really specific. But what Paul gets specific about is caring for widows. He spends 13 verses on it. I'm like, okay. That's, that's, that makes sense, but, but Paul, you talked about these, these godless myths and these old wives' tales and people forcing people to not get married or people, you know, saying you can't eat this and, and you know, saying these unbiblical things. And, and I want you to address that, but why are you talking about widows? I, I understand why he's not talking specifically about the false teaching because for Paul, his point is not to, to, to give more fuel to the false teaching. Paul is trying to, to, to talk about sound teaching because he knows that if I spend time talking about sound teaching, then these Christians are going to understand the, the proper way to live. But as I read this chapter over and over again, I just couldn't get past the fact that he would spend so much time talking about widows. And I think... Paul understands something that that a lot of organizations that work with money understand about fakes, about counterfeits. See, when it comes to to spotting fake money or counterfeit money, by the way, this isn't isn't Canadian money. It's Dominican uh, pesos. I don't know why. I couldn't find Canadian money in my house. So I had Dominican pesos. So anyways, if anyone wants to donate $50 for a future sermon analogy, I would (laughs) gladly take it. Um, But anyways... When you think about trying to spot fake money, okay, you would think that, you know, you would train people to spend a lot of time, you know, what are the different techniques, you know, the, you know, you know, scam artists use, what are are different counterfeit methods. But the truth is these companies, you know, the Bank of Canada doesn't train people like that. What do they train people? And they train people in the real money. They train people in spending time feeling and looking at the different angles and and getting familiar with the real money because when you get familiar with the real, that's how you spot the fake. You don't spend time thinking or looking or or, or, or dreaming about the fake. You spend time with the real thing. And when you're in the real thing, when you're, you're, you're following Jesus, you're easily able to spot the fake. Come on. So good. So we don't, we, don't, we don't preserve ourselves from false teachings by focusing on that. We preserve ourselves from false teaching by persevering in the mundane commands of Jesus. So Paul is saying this to Timothy. I haven't provided all the details about the false teaching. I've, I've talked to you about how you know you lead and all that stuff. But Timothy, if you want your fruit of your ministry to be good, don't neglect the widows. Because for Paul, the litmus test for a church that actually belongs to Jesus is how they treat the least of these. For Paul, a person, a church that is aligned with Jesus is a church that is aligned with the concern of Jesus. And the concern of Jesus is to look after the least. See, looking after the widows reflect a genuine Christian faith because when we look after the least, we look like Jesus. 
When we look after the least, we look like Jesus. See, see, widows in that time, they had no social security net. If they had no husband, they had no children, they had nothing. No government was going to help them. No organization was going to help them in the first century. They were truly alone. In fact, Paul said this, true widows are the ones who hope in God because that's all they can do. All they can do is pray night and day and ask for God help. And I just want to say, like, if you're someone who's a widow here, or maybe there's some of you who are spiritual widows where it's like no, no one in your family is following Jesus. You're, you're just alone. I just want to say, I just honor you because that's not easy. And Paul says, Timothy, look at these people. These guys are examples of faith. Don't neglect them. See, people aren't going to know we belong to Jesus if we destroy people in arguments, false teachers. Although we should respond intellectually to them, but that's not how they're going to know. Paul says, people aren't going to know if, 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 that we're Christian if we, if we put people in power and we say, hey, we're outlaw everything that isn't Christianity. That's not how people are going to follow Jesus. Jesus clearly says, John 13, 35, your love for one another will prove that you are my disciples. When we look after the least, we start to look like Jesus. And you find this all over scripture. When I think about the greatest historian in Christian history, I think about Luke who wrote the book of Acts. And he includes this account. I've always thought it was weird, but now it's coming to make sense. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. And it says this, in those days when the numbers of disciples was increasing, the church was growing, things were going well. The Hellenistic Jews amongst them complained against the Hebraic Jews because the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And then the disciple says, hey, here's what we're going to do. Brothers and sisters, let's choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the spirit and full of wisdom. And we will turn over this responsibility to them. And I'm like, that's so fascinating. Of all the things that we can use for people who are full of the spirit and wisdom, it's looking after the widows. And the disciples are like, yes, because that's so close to Jesus' heart. And if we get this right, the world will be transformed. Because if the world sees us looking after these people and saying, why are you spending so much time with these people? The world will see us and say, there must be something going on. No one else is doing this. And we need people full of the spirit to do it well. See, Jesus is saying this. And Paul says this in 1 Timothy 5 to 4. The people who put their religion into practice are the ones who don't neglect the least. Are the ones who don't neglect the least in their own family. Are the ones who don't neglect the least in God's family. Hebrews 11.6 says this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. What does that mean? It means that with faith, when we have faith, we start to please God. And faith is really waiting on God to accomplish his plans according to his promises. That means that that we have faith. Because Paul says this, when we are caring for the least, when we're actually looking after these widows, we actually are growing in our faith. We actually are pleasing God. So when we're doing this, God loves, loves to look at us. Why? Because we're looking like Jesus when we do those things. And Paul says, yes, that pleases God. Yes, that's faith. See, we're never more like God than when we honor the widows amongst us because when we do so, we are imitating God's concern for us. Because all of us have all been widowed by this culture. We've all been left alone. We've all lost faith at some point we've all been cast aside and God sees us in that moment and says you are mine but the world doesn't see value he redeems us and says I see you as valuable and the ones who understand that go to the least in the world and says hey the world doesn't see you as valuable I see you as valuable That's why when the Hebrew scriptures, when they're talking about who Yahweh is, the God of the Old Testament, they always say this, that Yahweh, he he, he loves the widow. He watches over the widow. He sustains the widow in Psalms and Deuteronomy. He loves the least. And Jesus never called the church, when, when it comes to looking after the least, he never called the church to depend on government. He called the church to depend on him. 
See, we don't put ourselves in these situations where we need God. We figured it out. The government would take care of that. The church would take care of that and all these different things. God is saying, I'm calling you. So I used to think spiritual maturity is having it all figured out. I used to think spiritual maturity is adequacy. I can fix my marriage on my own. I can understand the Bible on my own. I can, I can do all these different things on my own. But spiritual maturity is not adequacy. Spiritual maturity is dependency. It's putting yourself in situations where it's like, God, I need you to come through. See, spiritual maturity is childlikeness. Spiritual immaturity is childishness. Either way, we're all children of God. But we need to put ourselves in positions where we depend on him. Childlikeness depends on the father. Childishness is all about me. When we think about mission trips and when we think about youth ministry, you know, there's all these stats, 80% of people who don't, don't end up back in church after they graduate, and it's this big thing. But then the, the 20% of people or the 30% of people that end up in church, they've, they've done statist- um, research on these people. And the statistical thing that we find in teenagers who return to church are people who go to summer camp and who go to mission trips. Even teenagers who are on the fence, who people are like, I don't know if I know Jesus. But when you put them in a mission trip and they're like, I cannot depend on anyone else but God to meet this need. And God actually shows up. They're like, oh, my goodness, God's real. And they're like, oh, my goodness. But if you never put them in that situation, they just keep being the gods of their own lives. And as Christians, we need to be put in that situation all the time. Because when I think about Thomason, who saw God meet the need and show up for that story, he's never going to forget that. How are we creating this for all generations? When we look after the least, we look like Jesus. James writes to this church in Jerusalem. They're going through persecution. They're going through all these different things. The church leaders are fighting. Uh, things aren't going well. And he writes them. He's like, okay, you guys want to practice religion? He says this. Religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after the orphans and the widows in their distress. And keep oneself from being polluted by the world. See, if you want to not be polluted by false teaching, focus on this command of Jesus. Serve people. But don't just serve people. Serve the least of these because they'll challenge you to depend on Jesus. See, these false teachers actually were targeting the widows. See, how do you know who a false teacher is? Look at who they're targeting. These false teachers would go to these widows because, first of all, a woman didn't have a lot of education opportunity at that moment. So they would go to them and promise them education. But also, a lot of these widows actually owned their own homes because, the, you know, the, the, the husband passed away. So they would just have the right to their own home. So these false teachers would target these widows just to start meeting in their homes and forming new congregation. And Paul tells Timothy, you need to stop this. This is so opposite to God's heart. See, it's not just enough to know that when we look like Jesus... We do so by looking after the least. It's, we actually have to put it into practice. Why? Because that's how we, we, we stop ourselves from being polluted by the world, but also that's how we detect false teachers. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15, Watch out for the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. See, false teachers are hard to spot because they don't look like wolves. They look like sheep. This is like a great revelation for me. Because in my mind, when I think about false teachers, I always would just think they would like come into church. They would have like false teacher all over their shirt. And you could be like, hey, you're a false teacher. And they'd be like, oh, my goodness, you found me out. I'm going to leave. I'm like, yeah, you better leave. It's like that's not how it works. They don't look like wolves. They look like sheep. And the, the Bible makes their characteristics really clear, but they won't. They'll tithe, but it's out of greed. They'll sound humble, but they will exploit the least. See, according to 1 Timothy chapter 5, these widows started falling prey to false teachers. And they they actually started to deplete the church's resources because they were using these funds for widows for themselves. And Paul says, although you... 
you, you seem like you're living, you're spiritually dead. See, that's the fate of every Christian who doesn't look after the least. You look like you're living, you're spiritually dead. But when you start to look after the least, then you start to spot humility in other people when they look after the least. Because humility, Jackie Hill Perry said it best, humility is not a tone of voice. Humility is a heart posture that shows up in the way you live every single day. That's how you spot false teachers. And that's why honoring widows are so important because it's a litmus test. So I want to ask you a few questions. There's no guilt because I'm reading this passage. I'm like, oh, my goodness, like, I don't, I don't surround myself with people who are the least because I, I, don't, I don't think about it that way. So God has had to change my heart with that. As a Christian, are there any hidden needs in your immediate family that God has called you and equipped you to meet? Think about that. In your family, are there any needs right now? It's like, oh, I don't know if that, that, uh, that's something that God has called me to. If you're a Christian, God has called you to that need. When I look around my Christian community, I look outside of my family into my Christian community, is there a need that I can find and fill? Is there a hurt that that I can help heal? So if you do those, if you ask those two questions, you you get 100%. But I know some of you African parents like 110%, so I'm going to add another question for you guys, okay? Here's an extra thing, okay, for you guys. You can brag to your kids, like, I did the third question. I got 150%. As I try to meet the needs, as you try to meet the needs in your community, how can you involve the wisdom of other generation? If you're younger, how can you involve the wisdom of an older generation? If you're older, how can you involve the wisdom of a younger generation? I said this before, but, but, but older generation has timeless advice Younger generation has timely advice. It just means that we have to listen to one another. We need to be united. And these are so difficult. Like, these questions are so difficult. And maybe for you, you are a widow. Maybe for you, you're a spiritual widow. You're like, I'm just trying to get things, God, to move in my family. I don't know if I have anything else to give. There's There's a passage in 1 Kings chapter 17. And there's this widow, and she has nothing. And her son, her and her son have nothing. And... And this prophet Elijah comes, and out of that nothing, she shows hospitality. And God uses that to accomplish his plans according to his promises. And he uses her. So if you're in that situation, you're a widow, just want you to know you're not alone. The church loves you. I honor you. And you can actually... Serve someone else. You can help someone else. That's actually what Paul says a true widow is. Someone who in their need is still concerned about the needs of God. And maybe for you, you're not a Christian. You, you're like a fope. I love this. Like, you know, looking like Jesus. But I don't want to look like Jesus. I'm fine looking like how I want to. Maybe you're watching online. You don't know Jesus. As I'm reflecting on this, I was reading this book. It's called Practicing the Way by a pastor named John Mark Comer. And he has this this part of his book where he talks about the movie The Count of Monte Cristo. And he talks about this this movie. And in this movie, the main character, his name's Edmund. And he's betrayed by his best friend. And he's put in prison for the wrong, like wrongfully accused. He's alone in prison. And he meets this priest. This priest is called Faria. And he's actually drawn to this priest, this Christian priest, and he starts to spend a lot of time with him. He's drawn to the Christian priest, but he doesn't like the fact that this priest believes in God and Jesus. He doesn't like that part. So at some point, the priest is dying. And he's talking to Edmund. And he says to Edmund, hey, I know you're going to get out of there. You're going to escape. And I know you have a treasure waiting for you. And I know revenge is on your mind. But he tells Edmund, Edmund, don't, don't, Don't do it. For God says in the word, the vengeance is mine. So don't take revenge on this person. And Edmund turns to the priest and says, I don't believe in God. And the priest says to Edmund, it doesn't matter. He believes in you. If you don't want to look like Jesus, know that Jesus wants you to look like him. And he'll stop at nothing. 
whatever you choose in this world will make you a widow if it's not Jesus. It will promise you something and leave you dying. It won't satisfy. It will leave you alone, dejected, rejected. But Jesus believes in you. And he sees you in this moment, in, this, in, this, in, your, in, in, your, in your loneliness, and in, in your hurt, in your pain. And as a widow, and he says, I love you, I care about you, I see you, I want you. He believes in you. He wants to transform you. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a perfect life. There's still going to be trials and tribulations. But, but, but God says this, even in that, I'm going to make you into a person of happiness. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you joy. You will never walk alone. That's the life that Jesus offers. And guess what? When you think about what's good about this world, some people are like, I love living in this world. I love living in Canada. When you think about the hospitals, when you think about the social support systems, when you think about funds for feeding homelessness, you know who invented that? People who wanted to look like Jesus. It's Christians that transform the world. It's Christians that change the world. It's Christians that set culture. It's Christians that move mountains. It's Christians that, 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 that just provide for people. And that same God is inviting you to a relationship. So with every head bowed and eyes closed, I want to invite you. Maybe you're watching online. That same God is speaking to you right now. And he says, hey, I, I want you. I want my daughter to come home. I want my son to come home. If that's you, just look up at me and I want to pray with you. His prayer isn't something that saves you. It's just something that starts your relationship with God. God isn't looking for perfect people. He's looking for people who will be obedient. So if that's you, just look up at me anywhere. And if that's you online, just, just hit the button and, and we want to pray with you. But that's you, just pray with me. It's just you and God. The reason we ask people to close their eyes is just because it's between you and God. So just pray with me. Heavenly Father, I know I've sinned against you. I know I've chosen things that's led to death. But God, I know you're offering me life. Even when I was the least, God. You saw me and you loved me. You see me as valuable. So I thank you, Jesus. And I say yes to you, God. I thank you that you gave up your life because you live now, Jesus. I can live. And I don't just have a regular life. I have the life to the fullest, the life that God actually created for me to have. So I begin my relationship with you today, God. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you to stand up, and we're going to sing this, this last part of the song, Pruning. I just want to encourage you, whatever God is calling you to do, he's not done with you. He's always looking for people who aren't perfect, but who are obedient to the call. And if you're like, oh, God, I don't know if I can do this for my family. I don't know if I can do this for the church. You're in a perfect place because then you rely on him. So I pray that as we sing this song, God will bring these needs to mind, and we go out there and we would meet these needs.